Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Resuming Debate. Uh, those of you who follow me on social media will know uh, that I've been doing a lot of work lately on the so-called liberal McKinsey scandal. So this is the fact that under Justin Trudeau's liberals, the consulting company McKinsey has received over $100 million in contracts. Alongside that, the public service, certain public servants have off the record expressed doubts about what work was actually done for this money. And there's been a lot of discussion about Justin Trudeau's relationship relationship with McKinsey's former managing partner, Dominic Barton. Uh, the contours of that relationship specifically are, uh, are somewhat contested. So there's different aspects of this scandal uh, that, um, that, that the official opposition and other opposition parties have been talking about. Uh, one is the question of contracting out in general. How appropriate is it for governments to be contracting out for services if the expertise is or should be within the public service? Another question is value for money. What what was gotten for this spending? Uh, and then there's questions of control. Key decisions uh, were made, it seems, as a result of advice from McKinsey. Decisions were made a, as a result of a process that is probably a little bit more opaque to the public uh, than discussions that happen inside of the public service. Uh, that raises questions about who is, who is making decisions about our future as a country. Uh, and then there are if, issues of conflicts of interest. McKinsey having relationships with, with private organizations at the same time as it's having relationships with the government, uh, and then also questions of how the relationship between Dominic Barton and Justin Trudeau uh, influ- impacted or did not impact these, these contracts. So all of these are sort of questions that are out there in the mix, but I think one of the major underlying issues is what is McKinsey? What is this global managing, global consulting company that has existed for close to 100 years all about? Why do so many people hire them in the first place? Should we be concerned about that or not? What is their track record and so forth? So in the context of this discussion, a number of of books, interesting books have been written about the the nature of McKinsey and the role it plays around the world. The latest book to come out on it just at the end of the last year is a book called When McKinsey Comes to Town. And I do recommend that book as well. Uh, It covers some of the latest scandals uh, up to the minute. Uh, But I want to particularly recommend a book called The Firm, which is a few years older, uh, but provides a a comprehensive and I think very balanced history uh, of the firm from its founding up until uh, 2014. Uh, The book is called The Firm. The author is Duff McDonald, who works in New York, but who is a Canadian, and Duff joins us for the podcast today. Duff, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Great. Well, that was a a longer intro than than normal, but I wanted to to set the stage here. And on, on first blush, so I think the the logical question to ask you is why should people care about McKinsey? Aside from the day to day of the news cycle in Canada, I mean, what is what is important about this company that has led to a significant amount of public interest, a number of books written? Uh, what led you to take on this project in terms of thinking this McKinsey story is important for for the public to consider? So uh, I wrote the firm in 2000, it was, came out in 2013, so I wrote it about 10 years ago. One of the reasons that Simon & Schuster, my publisher, and I thought it was interesting was that it dawned on us in, in, in sort of taking a look at it before deciding to go ahead with the book. I, I came to them and I said, look, this might be the most influential group of unknown influence Hmm. in corporate capitalism for sure, but definitely in governments across the world. So the reason that that we wanted to write it, and the subtitle of it is The Story of McKinsey and Its Secret Influence on American Business. We said American just because we were selling the, you know, trying to sell a Mm -hmm. book in the States, but it could be just as well be Canadian business, Canadian politics. The point was that an entity had emerged in the constellation of power that had this really unique spot where they operated out of sight in typically confidential contracts, most of their situations. Government contracts tend to be a little more um, available for public scrutiny just because of laws, right? Whereas corporate, their corporate contracts tend to be all confidential. And they were a strategist and an advisor to the corner office whether it's, again, a company or a government. So if, if you step back and you say, what is it that they do? 
Uh, one way to describe it would be leadership of an organization that could go up to the point of being a prime minister has questions about what they should or could do. And McKinsey offers to come in and help research the question, what should we do? And I pointed out in the book, I said, it's a really fascinating thing to sell, whereas we think of people who sell products, right? If you sell running shoes or computers or music, right? Your buyer has to want that thing in order for you to make the sale. But McKinsey created this situation where they came in and they say to their clients, what are you buying? What do you want? We will sell that to you in the form of advice. So they found themselves into a really unique and interesting position of power where they helped leaders who were feeling some kind of uncertainty or wanted help with some kind of project or task to help them sort out what to do. That's a consultant, right? Yeah, that's really fascinating. So, so that combination of power with opaqueness, that's relatively rare in modern society. Generally, generally the more powerful an individual and organization is, the more we, we know about them. But this was a, a combination of, of a lot of power and influence on government, on, on corporate decision-making combined with a level of opaqueness. And then kind of connected to that, you're talking about just being interested in this fact that they present themselves as the people that are, are, are going to answer your big questions. They're not coming in selling a particular widget. They're coming in saying, what, what can we help you with? Right. The one anecdote, I can't remember who it's a quotation from, but, but you share in the book of McKinsey saying, you know, there are, there are some people that come, consultants that you bring in and you ask them what time it is. They'll tell you the time precisely. McKinsey will say, interesting, why do you need to know the time and what are the tasks you're going to perform based on, based on the time? Right. So there's a lot of, you know, the big, the consulting firms started by the, all the big six accounting firms like Arthur Anderson and the like. Um, those guys tend to do more nuts and bolts you know, help you overall your overhaul your IT systems or help you, you know, solve your procurement questions. McKinsey will do that too. But where McKinsey prefers to operate is the um, biggest questions of the question of the that the that the person in the corner office has. But one of the points that I made in the book too is a lot of us focus on, oh, well, they were brought in to address this issue, right? How should we figure out what to spend on uh, COVID relief across the 10 provinces? How should we do that, right? I make the point in the book that we do ourselves a disservice when we focus too much on the report or the so-called engagement, because at this point to hire McKinsey, there are all sorts of reasons to hire McKinsey that don't have anything to do with the actual report that they might produce at the end of that engagement. And let me give you a couple of them. Because they're so well known in corporate and political circles, to let people know that you have hired McKinsey puts a certain constituency or constituencies on notice that things have gotten real, right? especially mm -hmm. in the context of layoffs, which is what they do a lot of in their corporate work. But it essentially sends a message to people who might need to get a message sent to them. Things are serious now. We've brought McKinsey in. Another reason you might hire them is not because of the particular thing that they might tell you advice about what you might do, but because they work with, with so many other people like you. Even if you are the prime minister, they work with other heads of state you will glean by some kind of osmosis what others in your situation might do or might be considering. If you want to get a little more into the intrigue side, you can hire McKinsey uh, if you are the CEO or the prime minister, and they'll come in and say, what is it that you'd like us to do? And you say, well, we need to rationalize this thing here. Help us with that. They'll help you with, we think we need to shut down this division or this branch of the operation. And in doing so, they can be useful to a, to a leader to take out someone who is proving a problem. If the advice from them is, you should shut down this entire subsidiary, or you should shut down this program, that is our advice as esteemed advisors, when really what you're trying to do is get rid of the person who's in it because they've proved an irritant to you. So you, they can help you do that. 
And they can also help if you haven't the faintest clue what you're going to do, right? So that's pure consulting. And then I guess the last one I would say is, you know, we all have anyone who's in a, a competitive leadership position has people gunning for them, right? And, and coming at their back. And one of the reasons you would hire them is to take them out of the hands of your competitor, right? So you get the guys who know the most stuff working for you, and that will possibly get them on your side in some kind of contentious situation. So there's all sorts of reasons to hire them that have nothing to do with what they might actually tell you. Yeah, that, those, those are really important points. And I want to drill into them into a few of them a little bit later. I think based on what you're describing, like there, there are, there's a certain opaqueness to all of this. And you can understand why some public servants are saying, you know, they came in with PowerPoint slides, they told us they were going to change everything. We have a hard time actually distilling what they did. It's interesting as right. well that like, when you're talking about the big questions, right, usually in government, politics is supposed to provide the the fuel for those sorts of discussions, right? It's supposed to be democratic deliberation and legislators and that are pushing information up to the government saying, these should be the objectives. These should be the, the values that are guiding us. These should be the way we think about certain problems. And, and your, your description of some of the reasons why companies would hire McKinsey seems to me to be particularly incongruous with, with why governments would hire them. And yet a lot of governments seem to do it around the world. Here, here's a really important point, and this applies to both. It's not weighted to sort of corporate. It's, it's both. We live in an increasingly quantified time. Whenever we are confronted by the unknown, right, whether it's in business, politics, or life, it increasingly our first instinct is to count something, to try to understand it, right? So think of COVID. Think of all that data. Right. We were trying to understand what was happening because we couldn't grasp it otherwise. So if you're in government, right, and, and polls matter to you, right? Numbers of votes matter. So so there's a certain count that matters very much to any politician. But when we talk about things like what should we do as a government, increasingly the vast majority of our decisions will get made with the support of a data-driven argument. Right. And McKinsey set the standard early on as the paragon of data driven decision making. And the second part of that is so there's the data that we can gather about what has already happened. You know, we try to get cl as close to real time. You're trying to re count your way to reality. But then there's the future. And an argument starts to sound real good to people if it is articulated with a, oh, and this is where it looks like the trend is going. If we don't do this thing soon, everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket. Because look at what the future looks like. McKinsey are counters par excellence, and they will also predict the future for you. And so if you're in a job where part of the mandate is to persuade people and people are persuaded by data-driven arguments, McKinsey, it's hard to think of, there's pollsters, right? You guys have uh, your Angus Reeds and Ipsos and that stuff that do a lot of the political polling. But when it comes to tell us what's gonna happen, help us figure out what to do using a data-driven argument, McKinsey are the preeminent providers of that service to anyone who needs it. Yeah, what, what you're saying really resonates with your description of the early history of a company in the book, right? And this was something that jumped out to me right away is, is how McKinsey, you know, in the 20s and 30s, it came on the scene saying, we are going to approach business problems from a fact-based, objective, scientific standpoint. And on first blush, that's obviously very, very appealing. But I also think there are limits to the degree to which we can reduce philosophical or values-oriented questions to data points. And sometimes the rhetoric of following numbers and science masks certain values, presumptions. I wouldn't say sometimes. I would say always. Always. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and I guess one example from, from McKinsey's own background is you look at their work, compare their cross-border work on immigration, right? They did work for U.S. immigration during the Trump years. They did work for Canadian immigration during the, the Trudeau years. And in Canada, they had a, a numbers-driven, data-driven argument for saying there's, we should increase our, our immigration numbers. Uh, and in the U.S., they had a numbers, data-driven argument for saying we should be reducing the amount of money we're spending on food for immigrant detainees. In both cases, you have advice that has values underneath it presented in terms of numbers from the same company in very opposite directions based on a very different political context. Is this a problem for McKinsey's claims that on the one hand, the claim to use of facts and objectivity, but then in the inevitable lurking questions of, of uh, values that are underneath? Absolutely. I think that like you hit on essentially the central point that I tried to get at in the firm, which was, it's, it's sort of a manifold thing. Number one, if you have facility with data, anyone who's done data work with any degree of capability knows that you can make data say anything you want it to say, right? To your point about immigration. But the simpler one is things are great. Things are going great. You can go find some data that will appear to be great. Things are going horribly. You can go find that. So data is not as sacrosanct. In fact, especially quantifications are not as sacrosanct as, as our sort of culture of scientism has led us to believe, right? Data supports a point of view. Data is not a point of view. And it really is about getting to the essence of a thing. Right. So if you count the number of recent immigrants to Canada in a certain year, whatever that number is, right? I don't know what the numbers are. Call it a hundred thousand or something. That in and of itself, that number is not good or bad unless it is placed in the context of an argument that suggests that it is too big or too small or perfect. Right. So numbers are inherently empty, right? They basically are given meaning in their context. So McKinsey are the world's greatest crafters of arguments using data that support the point of view that you want supported. And this, right? is, this and, is part of the connection to the, cl the, the client, because part of what they talk about is client service. So what you're saying is that they are uh, adept at uh, marshalling facts to serve whatever the preferred direction of the client is exactly and or helping to you know if you take the big purdue pharma stuff in the states with oxycontin they basically are adept at helping you reconfigure around a uh, numerical target as if that it has meaning right it doesn't the numerical target is generally either just means more or less right bring our cost down bring our sales up the idea that they come in uh, bearing wisdom with them upon arrival, right? This is one of the great myths of strategic consulting, that they can come into a place where people do a thing every day, mm -hmm. right? So those people know how to do. They may be, have certain, you know, be better or less, you know, talented at it than, than others, but it's, if you want to know how to do something, you should ask the people who do it for a living. Right. Right. And we're increasingly in a in a in a stage in our post-industrial capitalist, overly educated societies where we have convinced ourselves that there's another constituency in addition to the people who do things. Right. The people who do things, I call them in my latest book, I call those people specialists. Mm -hmm. Right. If you want someone who really knows how to, like, if you want, if you're going in for an operation, you want the specialist. We've convinced ourselves that there's another group that knows just as much. And these are the experts. Experts deal in data and experts try to predict the future. So again, COVID, don't want to belabor it. But if you had COVID, right, if you come down with it, do you want to go to a infectious disease specialist? Or do you want to go to an epidemiologist who counts COVID? People may have needs for both, but generally what we want is the specialist. If you want help with something, you should ask them. So McKinsey rolls into places where people do stuff and deign to tell them how to do it better. 
because they are experts and experts count things. Experts by and large, and this is my definition, right? You might come across another one. So we bring the experts in who supposedly can tell us how to do what we do better, even though they don't do it. Right. So that, that's not even expert in the – because normally when I think of the term expert, I think someone who is expert at a thing, right? Okay, so uh, my, my it, division there is specialist and expert. Right. If you pick up the newspaper now and look at what, say, the Globe and Mail or the New York Times considers an expert, it's not a person who does a thing. It's right. a person who studies the thing. So I guess, I guess like the, 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 the most obvious comparison – for me is like in my line of work, there's a political practitioner and there's a, a political science expert, right? So there'll be exactly. there'll be articles that pop out that say uh, Garnet Jenis was wrong to do X or Y, says expert analyst political strategist who, you know, I don't right. know where this I don't know where this person comes from or like they've never been elected to anything. So but the division the division's real across the board. It's like you're doing a thing right and in certain realms it's politics in particular, then there will be the people whose job is to comment on what other people do yeah, or to offer them advice about what they should do. When what it really comes down to, right, the doer has to do the thing. And you can bring the expert in to, to you know, try and say, well, we brought the experts in and, you know, we have their advice. But at the end of the day, those of us who have roles to do, you still have to play your role or yeah. excuse yeah. I, yourself from it. And I, I think that, that you use this line in the book as well, that, that this is kind of the, the alienating effort to separate minds from bodies, right? Like that there are workers who, who do, do work without their mind and then there are experts who, are, who, who, who bring the minds to play without actually having the bodies that are doing the work. And maybe a more integrated humane way of thinking about work is that people are our minds and bodies at the same time that that the people that are doing the work should be thinking about about the work they're doing well you know um, what's amazing is is uh, so there's this guy marvin bauer who was sort of the spiritual yeah. leader of mckinsey yeah for decades he was a lawyer before at a big american firm called jones day that's still around and he basically said that he loved the strategic parts of law he didn't like the law parts of law right and so what he did was founded a firm which was a law firm that didn't practice law basically so he didn't want to do the doing he wanted to do the thinking right and what came out of it is a firm that specializes in thinking there's a reason they still get hired like they're they're delivering something to their clients, something is a value there. They've been around for a hundred years, but it's it's like you just said. We've sort of ceded a lot of power to people whose job it is to think about things, as opposed to doing things. And as you say, you'd I'd rather have it be both. If I were the prime minister, I would look for. I'm guessing here, but my I would hope that I would seek advice from former prime ministers more than outside experts who claim to know yeah. how to do this thing. Yeah, in this particular case, the question is around around advice from the public service, right? That if the, the, the public service, I think, traditionally would think of itself as, as both thinkers and doers. And of course, you draw expertise from, from other places, right? That's, again, part of democratic uh, d d deliberation. But the idea that you have an outside consultant group doing the thinking and then the public service constrained to to implementation is, is really alien to the way that democratic politics is, I think, supposed to work, where you have a lot of the thinking done on the, on the political public side with intellectually informed advice and thinking coming from the public service, and then implementation being done within the public service. Yeah. And it's, you know, on some level, as, as you pointed out earlier, people saying we don't, you know, they came in with their, their PowerPoints and stuff. There's anecdotes galore about in the corporate world about McKinsey people coming in and having all this stuff of advice and about what you should do and it being profoundly offensive to the people who actually have to do the thing because the person who's apparently figured out what to do doesn't actually know how to do the thing. Right. right? So they know how to think about it or presumably. That's the great divide. And so back to your the point we were making it does point to the fact that there are reasons that they are hired 
that must be more important than that simple task alone because they don't know how to do it better than the people who do do it. So then you say, well, then why would you hire them? Right. And then it said, well, there's got to be other reasons. Right. And uh, I, I do want to come to those other reasons in, in a moment, but but uh, just coming back to something we were talking about earlier, which is McKinsey's emphasis on quantifiable data kind of masks value presumptions that may come from the client or come from McKinsey itself. McKinsey does sort of nod to this reality when it talks about being a values-driven uh, company. And you chronicle well how there's been some some shifting and some contention about about that values-driven agenda. But as recently as, as, as earlier this year, we had Dominic Barton before the uh, Government Operations Committee in Canada, former managing partner, and he emphasized that McKinsey is a, is a values-driven company. In all the reading I've done about McKinsey, I, I, I actually have a really hard time identifying what those values are. So, so what's your take on this claim to be a values-driven company? What are McKinsey's values that are informing its, uh, its thinking, its advice? It's a great point. It's like, I met Dominic Barton a couple times while I was working on my book. I liked him. He's a nice guy. It was, we had decent interaction. As much as he would like to suggest that they can disseminate a certain value system from the top down there, I think that it is a, it is a, as clear as day that McKinsey's only significant value is to doing what the client wants them to do. What is the value system they're trying to disseminate? I, I haven't even gotten that far. Maybe in practice, they deviate from the value system, but what is the value system they are trying to embody? There is the allegiance to facts, which is I'm sure they consider truth, but facts are not truth. Facts are facts. You're, you're saying so many interesting things. I want to drill down on everybody, but when you're saying facts are not the truth, I guess what you mean is that facts are, are isolated things that are true, but whether or not they add up to the truth depends on being presented in the right way, right? Sure. I meant it even a little more philosophically than that, where a number of people at a thing, you could say that is true, right? If you're Right. Talking to like Donald Trump, how many people at my inauguration? We think a count of a thing is truth, right? And my point was a count of a thing is simply the count of a thing. Right. Does it point to broader, broader issues of, yeah. of ultimate truth and meaning? Yeah. Yeah. So you can say, yes, it's true that I have five fingers on my hand. Sure. But we're talking about a, a bigger truth. They really do put the client above all else. Mm -hmm. Right. So so if you think of when they say we're values driven, you know, they're talking both publicly. Right. So when they're when they're forced to ordain to speak publicly, but also like all languages, they're also speaking to clients, their potential clients and the values that drive McKinsey more than anything are adhering to the client's wishes. We will do what you want done. Mm -hmm. That is code for. If you need, if you are the client and they have, like you said, they have personal relationships, even though the government may have hired them, someone in the government hired them, right? right? Someone signed that check and they have an allegiance to their clients above all else. Purdue is the best example of that yeah. of, of all, right? Because what you saw, you saw it play out. They helped them do what they said they would help them do, yeah. come hell or high water. So in the face of a public health disaster, the values that they put out, which is allegiance and adherence to the client's wishes, held out in the face of, are we sure we should be doing this? That exact, like the client's wishes were paramount. So it's hard for me to think of, you know, I'm sure they have some list of, you know, honesty, integrity, and hard work, et cetera, fidelity, blah, blah, blah. But it's really the client. It's the client right. above all. So sub substantively, if we're going to distill down what likely the, the McKinsey concept of its values are in practice, it would be number one, allegiance to facts, and number two, allegiance to the client. 
And you, you can see how if that is the sum total of your values, that can lead in very dangerous directions, right? So, so just if I assume that many of our listeners are familiar with the Purdue story, but just just for for background, Purdue is the the company that invented OxyContin. They're they're seen as as really responsible for fueling, if not causing, the opioid crisis, uh, and uh, they hired McKinsey to help them with their declining sales. They hired McKinsey at a time when they were already under fire. They pled guilty in 2007. Purdue had pled guilty in 2007 to criminal misbranding of their product, and yet most of the work that uh, McKinsey did for Purdue was was after that. And, and they were providing advice on how to sell opioids, right? And they they had all sorts of ideas for how to do it. And and you can say, okay, they were working with facts in terms of how do we sell more more opioids to more people. They were serving their client, the people that had hired them. But what it is to be a moral person in the world is to take a step back and saying, is this is this advancing the common good? They were looking at facts and looking at the client, but not looking at the the common good. And and that you know, it's not the first time, right? There's yeah. um, scandal in South Africa, which they were involved in, where essentially you had the looting of the South African government, and uh, McKinsey uh, later claiming they had no idea what was going on right under their noses, and you basically have a situation where I've, I don't think I've come across a entity. So e even if you take Wall Street firms, right, which we typically will hold up the finance firms of all you people care about is money. They at least you can sort of see it's easier to understand their the motivations of sort of financial professionals decisions. McKinsey, they seek to please the client and, th and therefore hold a position of influence. They seek the continuation of that influence. And you can do that by giving the client what they want. There's a thing that was going on in the U.S. here for the better part of a decade, too, where they were accused of committing fraud on the U.S. bankruptcy courts. Mm -hmm. by not disclosing their connections uh, in bankruptcy trials. You know, in your typical bankruptcy, any professional that's involved has to take a look at the list of interested parties and submit a filing to the court saying that whether or not they do business with any of the claimants. It's not disqualifying. It's just the court needs to yeah. know if, if, you're, if you do business with the biggest creditor, for example. Yeah. And for the, for a decade or more, McKinsey was filling out its disclosure form saying, we have no connections to anyone on this list. When brought to light by a competitor, Jay Alex, almost as if they were laughing in the face of the U.S. bankruptcy system, because in almost every single one of those bankruptcies, it was not that they had no connections. It was that they were connected to every single interested party. Right. It, it, the majority of them. So in recent years, I would add one more value to the list, which is they're big enough now that McKinsey is true to itself, right? So it is, if the client is first, McKinsey's now large enough to broker influence here for influence there, right? And to help its own, to help its own business, to help its own hedge funds. So they're true to themselves after their client. Right. But the thing that you don't see on there anywhere is for the common good, right? Right. And it's not that surprising because they came in, remember, they emerged in the dawn of the American century and sort of during the uh, the initial fights between capital and labor, as you were yeah. saying, their role was we will advise management in this yeah. situation. So it's not surprising that they're, they don't hold themselves out for the little guy because they don't work for that guy and right. they make no bones about it. They work for the man who's signing the check. Yeah. And facilitator of the greatest number of layoffs in history. Yeah. And I, I guess there are, there are nuances in there too, where, uh, I mean, technically, if you're working for the good of the company, you should be thinking about the shareholders. But I think one of the criticisms are, are that in their work on executive compensation and that, that they, that they have really focused on not the, the principal whose agent they're supposed to be a representative of, but actually the person who is signing the check. Yeah. Right. It's a relationship business and they're great at it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. so let's so let's step back a second. And say okay, we can you can paint this all in sort of a dubious 
with a dubious brush. But if you look at it and say, let's say on a presumption that there was nothing untoward about it, uh, certain engagements, it's a smart strategy. Give the guy what he wants who's in power and he will hire you again. Yeah. Follow him to his next company or if he needs help getting his next job, help him get his next job. McKinsey's got one of the great alumni networks yeah. in the corporate and political realm, right? And it is a self-feeding mechanism. McKinsey yeah. executives tend to hire McKinsey. And here's another thing, too. You have to realize that we're talking about a particular slice of the population, right? We're t we are largely talking about MBA slash Ivy League slash Queen's Commerce slash university educated people, bureaucrats who believe in the power of data. The people who are running most of our companies and who are in political power in a lot of the West, if not elsewhere, come from this lineage. Yeah. Right. So it's not actually surprising that they believe that McKinsey knows what they right. need to know because they believe in the same things that McKinsey believes in. Right. So it, it's this core, core philosophical question of like, as you said, scientism versus, versus the sense of, of – the need to philosophically debate higher values that that may be outside of the realm of uh, of empiricism, right? I, I want to drill into one one aspect that you alluded to previously. I think it's really important. So McKinsey presents itself as working for everybody, and and that's and not everybody, everybody, but in a in a particular industry, there are some consulting companies that say we're we're not going to work for competing entities at once, right? We're going to work for for one major player in a given industry, and in some ways, that's that's more natural. You would think that that uh, people hire somebody to provide them with a competitive advantage, and in the process of providing that competitive advantage, they keep everything they learn in the process totally totally secret. Now, McKinsey does commit to the concept of client confidentiality, but on in what seems to be sort of contradictory to that, part of the value proposition that they present is that, you know, they're they're working for everybody across a given industry. They're learning different things from different players. And if you want to kind of find out what everybody else is doing, working with McKinsey is to your advantage. This is also an issue where maybe they're working across different contradictory sides, like they're working for the FDA at the same time they're working for uh, pharmaceutical companies or, or they're, you know, they're working for uh, tourism bureaucracy at the same time as working for companies that are impacted by tourism policy. So is, is, this, is this a problem? Is this an asset for McKinsey? Why do companies or governments put up with the fact that there's sort of an uncertainty to how what this company is learning about them through the engagement might impact their engagement with others? Short answer to the question, is this a problem, is we can't really generalize it. It's a problem when it's a problem. But to give a more detailed answer, I never came across my entire time working on the firm, except at the very end when one of their consultants was arrested for insider trading. He was giving information on a client to a hedge fund, which isn't quite the same as giving to your competitor. No one seemed to think that McKinsey was going to take their secret strategy and give it to their competitor. That didn't seem to be a concern. I think appropriately so, because that would be suicide as a consultant if that ever emerged, right? Yeah. I, th I, think that, I think what everyone sort of understood is, and this goes back, there was a there's a great book called The World's Newest Profession that I used as a, as a really valuable source for my book, where they were talking about how before the trust busting, large companies shared information amongst themselves. And then we got to this point where it was made illegal, monopolies and, and oligopolies. And so that kind of behind closed doors communication of the biggest companies in the industry was was made illegal. One of the arguments that the author of that book came up with was that the rise of consulting was an informal fix hmm. for that, that they would still get via osmosis, understand from each other best practices without having to actually share it with each other overtly. Like what's the distinction between not sharing client secrets and 
information happening to pass by osmosis? It's not what your plan is. It's how people do stuff, right? Okay. So process is huge. Process can obviously be a competitive advantage, right? In especially in the corporate realm, if you figure out a better way to organize yourself, but that's much more difficult to sort of companies tend to look at their intellectual property as more of a what the product is or what the plan is rather than how they do what they do. You know, not entirely. The whole idea of best practices, and this goes into all the um, university publications too, like Harvard Business Press and stuff, where mm -hmm. they're essentially churning the pre best practices out to each other. So there's a, it's a way to make that trade, which mm -hmm. is the McKinsey guy will know how we'll do what we do. He's not allowed to tell them that we're planning to buy company A or B, mm -hmm. but he will know how we do what we do. So when he's giving advice to others, his advice will come informed by that. And in return, you get the same thing. And I guess corporate people who hire consultants consider that a reasonable trade to make. Because they don't think they're about to lose the crown jewel, right? but they would like to know if they're the only outlier who hasn't figured out that you only need one printer for every 50 people, right? Or right. something like that. So they all consider that a fair trade. That's sort of understandable on the corporate corporate side, but it, it, it does illustrate what a big advantage it is for companies to deal with McKinsey when McKinsey is also dealing with their regulator. Because if they're getting information about structure, right. yeah. Okay. So that gets us to, it's a problem when it's a problem. Right. One of the things about the realm that McKinsey has found itself in, which is both genius and diabolical at the same time, is that there is no one who oversees everything right so you may have a government watchdog overseeing government contracts right so they're supposed to look at well what's the deal what's the consultant doing here what are we paying them etc but there is no one who looks over that who also has a window into every corporate confidential contract that mckinsey has when is it a problem it's a problem if the people who are not supposed to be playing both sides of the fence start playing both sides of the fence and no one else can see it until someone stumbles on it. Mm -hmm. Brought up a couple examples. There was one in one of their U.S. bankruptcies where they were working with a bankrupt whole firm. In the bankruptcy, the job of the trustee is obviously to maximize the value of the assets in the sale, right? sell the rest of the coal, see what we can get for it. On the other hand, McKinsey was at that very same time working with U.S. Steel, who was the biggest customer, one of the biggest customers of this bankrupt coal company. The mandate from U.S. Steel, obviously, is get us the lowest price possible for this coal. In that situation, those are not reconcilable. And in fact, if either side knew they probably would have been enraged. Apparently, some of the same people were working both sides. So if you have both uh, FDA or FTC consulting gig with McKinsey, and that information is getting into the hands of its corporate clients that shouldn't be, that's a problem, right? That's a violation of the public trust. My view on that, and I saw it a lot watching the bankruptcy stuff, is that the reason that it's both genius and diabolical is that there is actually no person, institution, or body who sits above it all. A good investigatory press, maybe, but good luck to them finding out confidential contracts, right? So basically, you have yeah. a company that has the influence to be straddling a thing which no one can see both sides of but them until such time as it may emerge that that was the case. It's an oversight issue, but you know, I look at it and I say, I don't even know how you solve that oversight issue because then you're basically saying nothing can be confidential anymore. 
there are probably different standards that are required for public and private contracts, but we've taken the position that it's legitimate for the Government Operations Committee in their review of McKinsey's work for the Government of Canada to request McKinsey's complete client list, not to necessarily make that all that information public, but to request it for the committee. Our democratic institutions are supposed to have you know, various officers who, who assess conflict of interest and do so on the basis of confidentiality. So, so I mean, I, I disclose a lot of personal financial information, for example, to the appropriate authorities that are reviewing conflict of interest. They're not disclosing every, every little bit of that, right? But they are, they are assessing issues of conflict. So it's, it's not implausible to think that there would be a solution to this. It's just obviously, you know, Kinsey has a track record for not wanting to comply with those kinds of, uh, those kinds of strictures. Right. And in the bankruptcy situation, a judge in one case asked them, they said, we need to know whether the McKinsey Investment Office has any investments in the following companies. And McKinsey said, well, we can't get that information. There's a Chinese wall. And the judge said, I'll have it on my desk on Monday, if you please. This is federal bankruptcy court. Yeah. Enough, enough of this nonsense. I'm sure they've refused to disclose or are going to refuse to disclose. And until they're told to by court, good luck with that. That's the thing. You've got an entity that is straddling some di some dividing lines. Another great book, and it's probably 40 years old, but I think you might find it very interesting yourself, given what you're looking at here. It was a book written maybe in the 70s, maybe in the 60s. It was called The Shadow Government. Mm -hmm. And it was about the privatization, a big push for privatization of the U.S. government and how McKinsey was brought in for all sorts of projects like at NASA, helping organize the White House staff. It turned out they had contracts to help privatize NASA. And guess who got a lot of the contracts? McKinsey clients. Right. They got criticized for that at some point, it, the sting was so severe that they basically retrenched from their Washington efforts, at least temporarily, yeah. mid-century. The other reason one can only hazard a guess is that the fees weren't as high as they were in the corporate sector. But today, the fees that governments pay for McKinsey work are hardly a fraction of the corporate work. Where, as I saw from looking the other day, there's you guys are talking about 100 million plus over a short period of time. The money's there again, so they're back. Yeah. But the shadow government basically made the case and pointed out and says, this is what would happen if they could do what they wanted to do, which is, yeah. again, it's influence brokering. Yeah. Duff, this is this has just been a phenomenal conversation. I suspect we could go on for a couple a couple more hours. This this will be the kind of final area I want to probe with you, and that is the question of capitalism and McKinsey's relationship to capitalism. So Dominic Barton said at our at our latest committee, his kind of parting shot at me after I asked him some some tough questions were that the book I was referring, he thought I was using as a source, which was one of many sources, but the book I would refer to, which isn't your book, it was the later book, but that it's just an, an anti-capitalist uh, thing. That that basically McKinsey, McKinsey and looking out for its shareholders and making money and taking care of its clients, it's just doing what good capitalists do. And the people that don't like McKinsey or, or are suspicious of it in some way, these are just people that are against capitalism. I'm a part of a center-right political party. I'm generally in favor of most aspects of capitalism. I have, though, a lot of concerns about McKinsey. How would you answer those that say this is, this is just about capitalism versus socialism, pure and simple? I'll give you kind of what might be the un an unexpected response to that, which is we were talking about truth before right? And facts. And facts, you know, we can generally agree on a certain set of facts and say this happened, that contract happened, and this amount of money there. The truth is elusive because the truth is all of it at once. None of us really has access to truth with a capital T. So what we are left with, you or me or anyone, is it's all just a particular point of view. So you see the world the way you see the world based on what has happened to you to this point. You're a center-right politician for whatever reasons brought you there. And you see things through a certain lens. And you may see them differently. You, you and I might stumble on the same fact and I'll say, that's great. And you'll say, it's proof that the Trudeau government should be out of office. We will see different points of view. 
So what Dominic Barton is saying there is he's saying a lot of what you people are looking at is not illegal when it isn't, presumably, <laughs> right? It's still, you know, we'll, we'll leave that to courts to decide what is legal and not. Point he's trying to make is seen from over here, we are just doing what we said we'd do. Seen from over where you are, where Walt and Michael at the New York Times, who wrote that book, seen from where they sit at the New York Times, which seems to think any CEO who makes any money at all is somehow robbing babies. His point is, you can only understand it from where you are. The point he makes, I'm actually in support of, in that we can all only see things from where we are. Presuming, and I made this point in the book, I was like, look, if, if you break the law, let us hope that you're caught and receive due punishment for doing so, or you're sanctioned or what have you. Short of that, we get into your questions of morals. It's like, what is the right thing to do? The answer to that question is not the same for all of us for when we're looking at the same situation. So I think what Dominic's trying to point out is he is acting in accordance with his beliefs. Just because our beliefs may be counter to it doesn't make him wrong. It means we have a different point of view. The only issue is that what's happening with McKinsey is they keep finding themselves in these situations where their actions do not line up with what they said they were doing or what they claim they didn't know or the stated purpose of the thing. In which case you have someone who's being duplicitous. Right. That's different. That's a different mm -hmm. than having a different point of view. Yeah. That's and, what I was just going to say about about capitalism in general is that capitalism only functions on some foundation of social trust. Right. Like if I tell you that I'm going to give you a widget in exchange for a certain amount of, of money, you know, there, there's sort of an expectation that that thing's going to work and you're going to pay the money. Right. And, you know, we're on the same page. It's like it's basically if we have people acting with good intentions, we we should be able to account and accommodate for different points of view, right? That's what whole dialogue's all about. On the other hand, if they prove to have been insincere or shading the facts or not telling us a very crucial thing which might change our opinion, right? So a new fact that might actually change your point of view. Oh, it turns out you're working with them too? We hope that people in positions of power and influence don't abuse the public trust but, you know, we're greeted with examples of that happening every single day. The question is, at least in terms of McKinsey, for me, it's like, I don't start anymore by believing them. Mm -hmm. If you take a situation and there's a, well, there's a he said, he said, she said, I don't automatically assume uh, sincerity on, on their part uh, anymore. Whereas I might have in the past, because it just keeps happening where we find out that that was not the case. And yeah. fool me one, twice, shame on me. It's like, it's, it just keeps happening, which to me suggests not necessarily a corrupt organization, but an organization that cannot control co the corruption of its people. Hmm. It may not necessarily be that as an institution, they're acting yeah. with ill intent, but it's, it doesn't seem obvious to me that they're able to prevent misbehavior on the parts of individual consultants there as much yeah. as uh, we'd like to think they could. Yeah. Bar Barton claimed that he wasn't aware that Purdue was a client even until the, until the very end, which, you know, which I, I, I find, I find a little right. hard to, hard to swallow, but, but you know, it, it, it yeah. I mean, it, it suggests that, that there's, there's some problem with either uh, maliciousness or, or inability to control you know, antisocial action. This has been a, a great conversation and, and it's provoked me to think in, in different ways about sort of philosophical history as well as the particulars of this scandal. And that's, that's what I hope to do on this podcast is to go a little bit uh, deeper behind the, the headlines. And I'm going to think a lot about your, your kind of reflections on the idea of, of truth. I'm from a school of thought that does, does believe that there is such a thing as maybe knowable truth. I also don't think that McKinsey, <laughs> McKinsey has it. Um, but I, I wonder if Part of the story of McKinsey is that in this kind of, um, you know, postmodern, less religious, less sort of intellectually unified society, that we're all that much more keen on finding sources of truth. And 
that that part of McKinsey's selling proposition is I mean it, it it's it's compared often to the Jesuits or it compares itself often to the to the Jesuits. Part of its selling proposition is we are the people who have the truth and you can buy it from us. Yeah, and I think I look at it differently. I think what they sell is fear, even if the buyers don't realize it. Yeah. The buyer thinks they're buying what they've asked to buy. And yet the rate of McKinsey repeat engagements, like they they have clients that go back decades, right? And they get, get bigger and bigger. So if you had hired them for problem X, and that problem is now in the past somehow, and yet they you still hire them for problem Y and problem Z, problem A through Z again, right? What have they sold you? They have sold you the thought that you need them. Right. It seems quite clear to me that they're very good at making that sale. They suggest that they have the truth in the form of the future. We can help you figure out what's going to happen. But guess what? The future doesn't exist, right? It's a guess. It's not yeah. real. So what they're actually selling you is fear. And apparently, and we know this, fear sells. So even if they don't say it outright, on some level, that's what they're doing. And again, go back to politics. Politics is a, is a, is a tough game, right? You're in your job until you're out of your job the next time the vote goes against you. It would, it's not surprising that politicians are drawn to their particular brand of expertise, mm -hmm. which is let us help you sort out the future. Because for a politician, at least part of the future is that you still have your job, right? So that's a seductive product mm -hmm. to want to buy. So it's not surprising that they're in high demand in any political system and any political party. Like you said, right? They don't pick sides. They'll work for anybody and anybody. You know, Dominic Barton said his issues with China too there, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but they sell fear and people are buyers of fear because we're afraid and they, they, they make them, they make us think that maybe the future isn't so scary. Maybe we've got it figured out. Again, I, as, as I said, we could probably go on for a couple more hours, but Duff, this has been a, just a phenomenal conversation. I, I, uh, I really enjoyed your book. Uh, the book is The Firm. Uh, it's, a, it's a comprehensive, detailed history of, of McKinsey, uh, and I hope that this conversation uh, whets everybody's appetite uh, to, to go out and, and read the book. You can get it on Audible, by the way, as well. I, I'm, uh, I'm a big uh, Audible user because I find with... Uh, uh, with five kids and frequent flights, it's easier to have a bunch of audiobooks on my phone. Uh, well, and uh, well, I got I've got another one for you, Garnet. It's the my latest is called Tickled: A Common Sense Guide to the Present Moment, and it gets at some of these. I talk a lot about McKinsey in there too. Okay. Um, but it gets at the issue of what we need to do is not be afraid of the future. What we need to do is grasp the present. It's mm -hmm. the only thing that's real. And if we get led around by the nose by people telling us they know what the future holds, they're lying. No one knows what the future holds. So the answer is present, right? It's focusing mm -hmm. on what's happening. So, sorry, I had to throw that in. A little nope, marketing nope. for me. Nope, no problem. So I, I, I haven't read it, but sounds fascinating. And thanks for plugging that as well. And we can leave leave links in the description for uh, for both of those. So folks, we, we come out with these episodes or we try to come out with them every couple of weeks on, on current issues where we go, we look at issues being discussed in the national headlines, but also we go beyond them. We dig deeper. We look at the, the history and the, and, the, uh, and, and, and the what is capital T truth and meaning of life questions uh, that are that are lurking in the background always. So thank you, Duff. Thank you to our listeners. Please leave a five-star review wherever you get your podcast. Please share this episode uh, and we'll be back in 14 days with another episode.